Oh my goodness, Hope Community Church, how are you doing this weekend? Sam Cannoli's with me in the house. How you doing, uh, man? I'm doing great. How are you? I am well. Hey, we have a bunch of stuff to talk about, not Tons. only about your world, which that's one thing. Lots in my world this Lots time. Lots in Sam's world, but we've got some other things that we're going to talk about in just a second. Okay, Sam, here's the deal. 32,000. What's that mean? 32,000. 32,000. Check this out. So last week in yep. service, they mentioned that we had over 20,000 pounds of food that was donated to our food drive. Correct. And just in that time when we made the ask that we were getting low and we needed, we extended the time, yep. right, to the Sunday. 32,000 pounds and it came from you. Thank you all. Thank you, Hope, so much. I would say thank you in different ways, but this video will do it better than I ever could. Check this out. Sam, I came into Apex this week, right? Yeah. And as I was uh, hanging out with them, I start watching people come in and they've got bags of food and they've got bags of food and they're dropping it off. And then they're going out to their car, getting more bags of mm -hmm. food and dropping it off. Unbelievably cool. We're talking about 16 tons. 16, 32,000 pounds, that's y'all. That's, that's a ton of food. I think we're gonna be okay. We're gonna I be all right. we're gonna make it. So yeah. thank you, Hope. This is what you all do. This is why I love this place. So thankful. Hey, we got some things to talk about in your world though. Oh, indeed we do. Oh, we do. Uh, Worship auditions. Listen, if you missed last week, well, first off, shame on you. But secondly, <laughs> um, we are having worship auditions. We are expanding our worship team. It takes a lot of people to be able to serve four campuses, online campuses. And so, listen, if you're a singer, um, you're a musician, and you're looking to step up, you're serving here at Hope Community Church, we want you to show up at our Raleigh campus Monday, October 25th at 6 p.m. We're gonna be having live auditions, and so we're calling on you. Now, is it like chair turns and stuff like that? Is it like- Yeah, see, I heard about that, uh, that you know, that we're gonna have like the four chairs. Right, and like made mention of that, button or the something. X you know? button and all that stuff, which is totally not true. Okay, so it's- Totally, it's totally false, because we haven't even ordered the chairs yet. Okay, so, good, yeah, they're not gonna get uh, time. It's not gonna be that no, kind of thing, no, yeah. But no, on, on a real note, we are looking for some great people who love God, who love people, and who want to serve this church through music. And so if that's you, make sure you sign up. Okay, now talking about people who want to serve this church through music, we have this event coming up that we do every once in a while called Thursday Night Live Plus. Indeed, indeed. And tell us a little bit about that because it's coming up soon, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's actually the last Thursday Night Live Plus of the year. Listen, if you have not been to a Thursday Night Live yes. Plus at Hope, what are you doing with your life? What are you <laughs> doing with your Thursday nights? Stop it, show up, because we actually have these unique experiences unlike any other service right. at Hope. That's right. Where we go deep, we have some time, in worship that we just don't do at any other service and yeah. so make sure you get it in before the year is yeah, out yeah it's man it's one of the best times that we have and those of you who, ha who have been there you know and you should be bringing people with you because oh, yeah. Thursday Night Live Plus is incredible, okay? Yeah. Okay, Sam, this is the last week of a series that has been unbelievably helpful, right? Oh man, if you could just know the kind of conversations we've been having in the green room when we're talking about, this series has been so impactful, so introspective, it's been incredible. Yeah, we're in a series called Inside Out, and this series has been talking about the things that have been happening in the last year and a half with all the pressure that's on us all the time, that there's feelings that are inside of us and they're starting to come out, and maybe that's not a great thing for the people that are around us and so we've got to deal with things like hurry and anxiety and fear and anger and this week chase is going to walk us through addiction okay yeah. and this is what we're gonna how we're going to end the series yeah 
parents, I need you to lean in for just a minute on this, okay? This is gonna have, this series today, or this, this sermon today is gonna have some topics in it that might be a little PG-13 in nature. We're gonna talk about all kinds of addictions, okay? And with that in mind, you may wanna think about how your children will respond to that. If you're at a live campus, this might be a great opportunity for you to check out Family Ministries and what we have to offer for your younger children. And if you're online, you may just wanna watch this by yourself. It's great content and it's gonna be really, really helpful, but I know some people might feel like, take it easy on what you're talking about, my kids in the room. If that's you, just know that's coming now. You've got time before Chase teaches, okay? But for the rest of us, this is gonna be a really, really helpful message. Yeah. Addiction is one of those things that we think everybody else has, and that just may not be the case. Right. Okay, so this is gonna be a great message. I am really, really excited. There's only one thing left to say. Welcome to Hope.
darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond all creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the lord our the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry let the earth respond all creation shouts with a voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God yeah we will not be moved when the earth the risen Savior Jesus who showed his power over death and the grave and showed his love for us and he now shall reign forever because of that so let's worship today and he shall reign forever strongholds now surrender for the Lord our God has overcome who can be against this Jesus our defender he Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at GetHope.TV. We're so glad that you're here today. And if this is your very first time watching, we want to extend a very special welcome to you. You picked a great time to tune in because this weekend we are going to be wrapping up a series that we call Inside Out. Over the past few weeks, we've been diving into topics about all of our emotions and our feelings, uh, things like anger and anxiety and depression and hurry. And all of those have been great messages that have been super, super helpful. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to go back and check them out. But this week, we're gonna be wrapping up the series where we talk about a very serious topic, and that's addiction. Now, I wanna be clear that today we are gonna talk about addiction in all of its forms. So if you're watching this with your family, maybe you're on the couch right now and you have kids or teenagers next to you, I just wanna give you a warning. Today's content might be a little adult in nature and this would be a great time for them to check out some of the online offerings that we have for kids and for students. So you can head over to theparenthub.net for the links and all the information that you need for those services. But as for right now, let's hop back into worship. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light 
Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle I accepted Christ when I was 15 at a church, and then maybe a month later, my parents separated, and I was like, I don't want any part of this. I don't want God. I don't want Jesus, and screw all of this, and I did. So I didn't talk to God. I didn't talk to Jesus. I went away from Him. I would um, start doing just really anything that could get me high, cocaine, um, pills. Pills are my favorite because it was the easiest thing to get. At first, when I started doing drugs, it was fun. It was something I did with my friends, and it was something that I just enjoyed doing. And it was something that made me fit in with friends. And we lived in a small town. There really wasn't much else to do except 
getting high on the weekends and it gave me fun stories to tell. For me, it wasn't as much as wanting to shoot up or wanting to get um, a certain drug versus just getting high period. So I wanted that escape. I wanted that uh, moment where I didn't have to think or feel and I could just escape the world and be in my own little bubble that no one else was in. I honestly, for eight years, I don't think I remember much because it was such a haze of just highness. I didn't know in the moment that I was addicted. I didn't know or didn't feel like I was addicted because I felt like I could control it the entire time. It wasn't until I wanted to control it was when I realized I have an addiction, that I have a problem. And that wasn't until eight years later when I tried to stop. And the withdrawal from that was so intense that then I just started again and again. And then um, finally, I just decided enough was enough. My friend that was also drinking a lot with me, that was, she wasn't doing drugs, but she drank a lot with me and we were the partiers. It wasn't until she started going to church was when I was like, okay, I'll try. And I remembered God, but I never really had that relationship. Then once I started going, I started to have people around me that held me accountable. They didn't know, but it was the fact that someone else, they loved me, they cared for me. That's when um, I started to go. I was in such this funnel of shame that I couldn't get out of it, that I would wake up and feel like, oh, why did I do that? How could you do that, Christina? You like. I just felt dirty too. I just felt like there was this something I couldn't wash away. For me, that helps me is one, knowing God's Word, two, practicing God's Word, but also taking care of me, taking care of my body, taking care of um, making sure there's people around me that can love me, that I can talk to, that helps me uh, when I start feeling like I need to do it again. Eight years on, I still have to remember to center myself with Jesus every single day. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Christina, welcome to those of you online or at one of our campuses, uh, Apex, Morrisville, Garner, Raleigh, or here in the room right now. Uh, every single week of this series, we have started it off with someone on staff, a staff member here at the church, sharing their story, their struggle, really our struggles uh, with things like anger and anxiety and depression and hurry or busyness. And today we are going to talk about addiction. And uh, we're just going to jump right in. Uh, studies have shown that addictions are on the rise, and that shouldn't surprise us. Um, during the lockdown, many of the places that addicts either got sober or stayed sober uh, simply couldn't operate. AAs and NAs had nowhere to meet. A lot of group therapy sessions had to be moved to online and a lot of people simply couldn't join. Uh, but besides that, the stress of the last 18 months have caused many of us, mainly all of us, uh, to reach out for some form of escape. Uh, new unhealthy habits might have been formed. Old habits that you thought you were through with might have resurfaced. Uh, maybe in the chaos and the stress of the last few months, or maybe just in the boredom of being stuck at home for so long, you found something that helped you cope or numb or escape. And if you're honest, that something might have just kind of taken over the past few months. Um, that can be big things. Those can be small things. Uh, I remember at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, I said, I want to watch Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives from the very beginning. That was a few months ago. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was laying on the couch, and uh, I, if you don't know Diners, Drivers, and Dives, it's an amazing show. And uh, Triple D, for those of you in the know. And I've been laying on the couch for about two hours, which is a feat if you're married and have three kids and a dog. So I paused it to see if everyone was okay. And up in the upper left-hand corner, I saw these letters and numbers that shocked me. It said S22E8. So I started at season one, episode one, and I was 22 seasons in to watching Guy Fieri eat hot dogs and tacos. Now. Triple D, in my opinion, is the pinnacle of cable TV. It might be the best thing that has ever been set to film, in my humble opinion. You can prove me wrong. But 22 seasons, that is too much. And maybe you experience something similar. Uh, you look down at the number on your bathroom scale, and you're kind of scared. Or you looked in your recycling bin in the garage, and you're like, that's a few too many bottles and cans this week. Uh, or you looked at your bank account, and you're like, there is no way I'm spending that much money on that thing. And what I want you to see is that addictions have a huge range. Uh, we all know that people struggle with serious addictions, that people are dealing with that, and I don't want to dismiss those. Uh, things like drugs, uh, substance abuse, gambling, uh, pornography, alcohol. 
And there's other disorders that fall loosely into the family of addictions, uh, eating disorders, self-harm. Uh, and those are the type of things we commonly think of as addictions, and uh, they are, and we should take those seriously. Uh, but what I want to show you today is that those aren't the only things that can be, compri- can, can be explained as addictions, and the people that struggle with those things aren't the only people that are addicts. Uh, you know, I have a similar story uh, to Christina. Some of you know my story. Uh, I began experimenting with different substances uh, from the time I was in seventh grade, which is crazy to think about because I have a seventh grader right now, um, all the way up until I was about 20 or 21. And like Christina, uh, it wasn't one substance. It would be easier for me to tell you the drugs that I have not experimented with than to give you a list of all the ones that I've tried. Uh, And there were seasons where I used pretty regularly, and uh, there were a few moments in my life where I found it really, really hard to stop. Uh, But in 2006, I met the girl of my dreams, and she wasn't having anything to do with that. So I stopped. I stopped back in 2006. So I haven't used a single drug in 15 years. And some of y'all need to hear that, because, yeah, that's awesome. But some of y'all think that I just stopped running a drug cartel like last month because you'll come and find me and be like, you're the only one that understands. My sister's the biggest meth dealer in Wake County and you know, you know what that's like. I'm like, I don't. I have no idea what that's like. It's been 15 years, okay? So I haven't used in 15 years, but what I've realized is I'm still an addict and not in the way that people commonly use that phrase. You can put any drug you want in front of me and there is nothing in my heart that is tempted to do that. I'm too old, I got stuff to do. I don't know how strong stuff nowadays is. I am good with diners, drive-ins and dives, okay? There's no temptation towards drugs, but I do feel uh, this, this pulling inside my heart towards other things to help me cope or to help me escape during certain seasons. Things like affirmation, things like busyness, things like applause. And many of you might be like me. You went from weed or partying and you have moved on to achievement or to money. Uh, You went from pills and you've moved on to acclaim or to people pleasing. See, all of us here listening online or at one of our campuses or in the room right now, all of us have found ourselves tempted to reach out to something during a certain season in our life to help us cope, to help us numb, to help us escape. And the reason is because an addiction, just in its broadest sense, is really a personal attempt to solve an emotional problem. That's all an addiction is. It's a personal attempt to solve an emotional problem. It's just, it's just it gets out of hand somewhere along the way. That's how all addictions begin. So you feel shame because of something that happened in your past. You don't like that feeling, so you find something that helps you numb or escape that feeling. Uh, You're in a certain season where you feel like everything's out of control, so you find something that helps you feel in control. Uh, You feel unimportant. You feel looked over, so you find something or someone that makes you feel important, that makes you feel powerful. Uh, You feel uncomfortable in your own skin, so you run to the comfort of food. Uh, You feel the stress and the anxiety of working and raising kids, so you run to alcohol, you run to wine, anything that makes you feel relaxed. This is something that we all do. We all have emotions that we don't want to feel, and so we all try to personally solve them. Now, at first, this is not a bad thing. But it's when that coping behavior or that coping mechanism happens day after day, after week, after week, when it becomes habitual, that's when things go south. So you might be listening right now and not think that you have an addiction, and in reality, you do. You might not think of your Netflix binging as an addiction, but it could be. You might call your addiction a fit lifestyle or an an intense exercise uh, regimen. Uh, You might say, this is just a little comfort food uh, before bed. It's not a big deal. You might say this, oh, this, this is my emotional support vodka. Okay, no big deal. Uh, It's not a problem. You can call it whatever you want, but often those things that we lean on have a way of becoming a low-level addiction without us even knowing it. In fact, some psychologists would go so far as to say every single person here is an addict in some way or another. Uh, Gerald May says in his book, Addiction and Grace, you should buy that book and you should read it. Uh, He says this, after years of working with addicts, I've learned that all people are addicts, that addictions to alcohol and other drugs are simply more obvious and tragic addictions than others have. To be alive is to be addicted. And to be alive and addicted is to stand in need of grace. 
That's why I don't think it's helpful to narrow addictions down to just the serious ones that we commonly think of because addictions uh, can, can come in many different forms. But see, the main problem in trying to, form, in trying to solve our, our emotional problems personally uh, through coping or through numbing is that what we're really doing is we're just numbing or covering over symptoms of what often is a much deeper and much worse disease. So if you've learned anything in the past five weeks, you should have learned that emotions are one of the primary ways that God speaks to us. They're one of the primary ways that God says, hey, something is not right. There's a problem, warning, warning, warning. And so when we cope, when we numb that day after day, we're really just turning God's notifications off, right? We're not allowing him to address the underlying issue. It's like if I had a real bad problem with internal bleeding, okay, that's going to cause a whole bunch of bruises on my arms and legs and stuff. But I figure out along the way, well, I'll just put makeup on it, right? That covers over the bruises. No one asks questions, no big deal. So I go on about my day, then I shower. I'm like, well, the bruises are back. Let me put some more makeup on those bad boys. What if I did that day after day after day after day? What, what am I really doing? I'm making the problem worse by not addressing the underlying issue. Some of us might be in this room right now, we're listening online and we have been covering up the symptoms and we just haven't dealt with an issue for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. See, if we ever wanna be free from our addictions, big or small, we have to address the underlying problem. And the Bible helps us do this in a way that nothing else can. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter one. We're gonna be jumping all over, but go ahead and turn there. Uh, the Bible has a ton to say about the topic of addictions. But as you begin reading on the topic and studying to see what it has to say, you'll find out real quick, the Bible doesn't use the word addiction and it doesn't label people addicts. Instead, for the term addiction, the Bible uses the word idol. Everyone say idol. And instead of the word addict, the Bible calls people worshipers. Everyone say worshipers. And I think this is so helpful because that's what a full-blown addiction really is. It's worship. I mean, what do you do when you worship something? You think about it. You turn to it in times of trouble. You, you look to it to save you or to give you something that you lack. That's what the relationship is like between an addict and their addiction. And see, the Bible doesn't say that there's just a subset of people that are addicts. There's just a subset of people that are worshipers. The Bible says every single one of us is a worshiper. The Bible says we're all worshipers. From the moment we open our eyes and take our first breath on this planet, we are natural born worshipers because that's how God created us to be. Some of you remember the old worship song, you and I were made to worship. It's true. Every single day of our lives, there's this pull of our hearts, this desire in our hearts to seek after or to search for something or someone to worship, something to serve, something to give our lives to. And that's what helps us explain and make sense of this, this constant pull in our hearts to all these different coping mechanisms. It's this worship impulse that we're born with. We are natural born worshipers. And the Bible says there's not even a time that you start to worship. You just aim it, right? You just aim it. And the problem with our hearts is that our aim is off. We aim at the wrong things. I have an illustration here about potty training a son, but I'm not going to use that example. I'm not that kind of speaker. We're not that kind of church. But uh, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 1, and uh, he's talking about what went wrong with the world. He's talking about what, why is the world so broken, so flawed? Why are humans so messed up? And he says the root reason of all this brokenness is misplaced worship. Look at what he says in Romans 1.21. He says, yes, they or human beings, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. And so they worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the creator themselves. They, cre they, they, they traded God for a lie. 
That's what went wrong with the world, and that's what's still going on, especially when it comes to addictions. Now, I know idol worship is something that's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around. We're like, we do not bow down to wooden idols of reptiles or birds or fish, and we don't, but we do bow down to the almighty dollar, right? We do bow down to productivity. See, when someone is in the throes of addiction, they really have exchanged God and traded him for a bottle. We trade God for images on a porn site. We trade God for applause or for comfort or for control. And so if you're struggling with an addiction, Paul would say that your main problem is not a physical dependence on a substance, although that might be part of it. Your main problem is a worship problem. You've you've taken something that God has created and you've put it in the creator's seat and you're looking to it to satisfy you, to fulfill you, to give you something that you lack. And the crazy thing about an idol is that an idol can be a bad thing. We're familiar with that. But an idol can also be a good thing. Your marriage can become an idol. Your family can become an idol. A relationship can become an idol. Your job can become an idol. It's called workaholism. People liking you can become an idol. Anything can become an idol. An idol is anything that you put in the place of God and look to it to save you or to fulfill you. You worship it. Uh, One of our elders says, uh, when uh, you make a good thing a God thing, it becomes a bad thing. He said that on Facebook this week. I'm like, that's too good. I got to steal that. And it's true. So ask yourself, is there something in your life right now that you are deathly afraid of, of losing? Is there something right now that if you did not have, you would not feel fulfilled? You would not feel complete? You would not feel satisfied? And if the answer is yes, it might be an idol. And what we see in the Bible is that the worship of idols has horrible consequences. Uh, The prophet Isaiah uh, speaks to the nation of Israel when they're they're in the middle of just a real big uh, big idol worshiping problem and not just physical idols, although they did do that, but also things like pride and money. Here's, Here's what Isaiah says. He says, how foolish are those who manufacture idols? These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this, so they're all put to shame. Who but a fool would make his own God, an idol that cannot help him one bit? The person who made the idol never stops to reflect, why it's just a block of wood. I burned half of it for heat and used it to bake my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a God? Should I bow down to worship a piece of wood? The poor deluded fool feeds on ashes. Listen, he trusts something that can't help him at all. And yet he cannot bring himself to ask, is this idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? That's a picture of an addict. Trusting something that can't help you at all and yet refusing to believe this is a lie. But see, Isaiah is talking about something that all addicts eventually do come to the realization that they really are worshiping a lie. What once was really a convenient fix to an emotional problem becomes something way worse. Eventually, all addicts realize, okay, this thing, this idol, this addiction, it really is just a momentary fix. We talked about this. The emotional problem is still there when the buzz wears off, when I wake up in the morning, when the Netflix show is off. The fix never lasts. In fact, it it, it causes unintended consequences. And also what addicts realize really, really quick is that every single addiction or every single uh, idol, there's actually a glass ceiling to it. You know what I mean when I say that? There's a built-in governor to every single pleasure that God has given us. Have you ever been uh, stuck behind a school bus and it's going 45 on the highway? You're like, why can't you go faster? It's because there's a governor in the school bus. It can't go any faster. And it's the same with every single gift and every single pleasure that God has given us. God has said it can give you this much pleasure and no more. So food is an amazing gift from God. But God said food will only give you this much pleasure and no more. Wine. Wine is an amazing gift from God. But some of you know, you get this much pleasure. If you go above that, it gets unpleasurable, right? Um, Sex is an amazing gift from God, especially in the confines of a marriage. Only in the confines of a marriage. But even uh, in, in those confines, sex can only give you so much pleasure and no more. Right? One piece of cheesecake is good. Two is even better, in my opinion. But three or five or 10, no, that's no good immediately and in the days after, you know what I'm saying? Um, See, our culture knows this. Have you ever been um, stuck in line at the grocery store and looked at some of the magazine articles? You're like, no, I'm looking at my phone. Well, look up next time. 
And what you'll see is that on all these magazines, there's the titles of all these articles that teach you how to get the most out of the sex that you're currently having. And there'll be titles like 10 tips to please your lover or five techniques to make your love life soar or three ways to have the best sex of your life. It's on Glamour, it's on Cosmo. I think I saw it on Auto Trader like this week, but <laughs> they're everywhere. Why are those articles there? It's because sex, like everything else, can only give you so much pleasure and no more. And our culture hates that. Our culture can't accept that reality. It says there has to be more. There has to be some technique. There has to be, there has to be some secret to squeezing out just a little bit more pleasure. But there's not. Because every pleasure that God has given us when we enjoy it correctly is meant to be pleasurable to a certain extent, then turn our hearts back towards him and worship and thankfulness and gratefulness. It was never meant to take the place of God. It can't do that. And when you begin to use these pleasurable gifts that God has given us in an improper way, what you also find is that every addiction and every idol follows the law of diminishing returns. If you use these gifts in a way that God didn't intend, that glass, that glass ceiling gets lower and lower and lower. Your idol over time will demand more and more of you and will give back less and less. And this is where we start getting into hardcore addiction. You need more and more alcohol to feel that same relaxation or that same buzz. So you go from beer to wine to the hard stuff. Maybe you take a tolerance break so you can feel that feeling again. Or maybe you refrain from eating food before you drink. You're like, pastor, you know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Your binge watching sessions or your binge eating sessions become longer and longer. The type of pornography that you look at becomes more and more extreme until you get to a point where you're like, I can't believe that I watched that. Because the payoff diminishes over time. And as the pleasure gets less and less, the consequences get worse and worse. And it's at some point in this process where you go from, this was something really nice that helped me cope, that helped me escape, that helped me numb. And now you've gone to, I don't like the type of person that I've become. And I don't know how to stop. I don't know if I can. And that's when an addiction has taken over. See, at some point down every path towards idolatry, the idol stops serving you and you start serving it. At some point down every path to good and bad things that become God things, every path towards idols, it becomes the master and you become the slave. In fact, that's a good definition of, of addiction, voluntary slavery. The most really br brutal and realistic picture that I can think of, um, of idolatry, of addiction, it's in Jeremiah 2. We referenced during, uh, during our talk on depression, but it's Jeremiah 2, 13, where it says this, for my people have done two evil things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. And it's this picture of just this oasis in the midst of a desert. And it's this fountain of flowing water. Everything that you could ever want, everything that you were created for, everything that you need for satisfaction and fulfillment and contentment, God is just freely offering you. But there's something inside our broken human hearts that make us want to turn our back towards that and instead get on our knees and start to dig. And so we're in the desert and we're digging and we're digging and we're digging, but there's no water. So we have to go deeper and deeper. So we dig and we dig and our muscles get sore and our hands start to crack and bleed. And finally we get to just a little thimble full of dirty sandy water and we drink it and we're like, oh, it's so nice. But it slakes your thirst for about two seconds and you gotta dig some more and you gotta dig some more and you gotta dig some more. And finally, you get a little bit more water and you drink it and it slakes your thirst for two seconds and you gotta keep digging and you gotta keep digging and you gotta keep digging. And at some point in this addiction, in this idolatry, you find yourself more thirsty and more tired than you've ever been in your entire life and you're in a deeper hole than you ever imagined you'd be. So much so that you look up and you're like, I don't know if I can even get out of this. Now I've been, I've never been to the point of dangerous physical dependency, but I've been close before. And I remember two feelings. Christina uh, said them both. Um, 
just this immense sense of shame. Like, how did I get here? Especially as a Christ follower, you call yourself a Christian. Just these feelings of almost self-hatred coupled with just this feeling of hopelessness. Like, I think, am I stuck? I don't know if I can get out of here. I've been there. Some of you are there right now, maybe secretly. And you're functional, but you're stuck. Some of you are 25 steps down that road. You just don't know it yet. And if that's you, I just want to take the last few moments to speak to you. Here's what you need to hear. You don't have to stay there. I know it's so hard to believe, but you don't. You don't have to stay stuck there. And I'm standing here and Christina stands here and I can point to a few people in this room right now that are living proof that through Jesus Christ you can find healing. And I want to read you out of Romans six fourteen, a verse that I clung to during this time. And if you're a Christian, listen, this is so true. Sin is no longer your master. It's not. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And if you're an addict, those are the two best words you can hear. There's freedom. And there's grace. There's grace. You may be shocked and embarrassed at getting to this point. But God is not shocked. (laughs) You might be embarrassed that you ended up here, but God is not embarrassed of you. He loves you, not a future version of you, but right in the bottom of that pit, God loves you and he wants to bring you freedom. He does. Freedom from your bondage, freedom from your slavery, and he's the only one that can. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And so in order to receive that grace, in order to receive that freedom, there's just two things you need to do. And you know what you need to do. You just haven't done it yet. The first thing you have to do is you have to admit that you have a problem. You have to admit that you're stuck, that something has kind of taken over, that what you once could control, you just can't control anymore. And you don't just need to admit that to yourself. (laughs) That's a good start in this place. But you also need to admit that to someone else. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a pastor at one of our campuses or online. Maybe it's your roommate Maybe it's a classmate. Maybe it's someone in your small group. But you need to admit to someone that you have a problem. And here's the cool thing. If you're a Christ follower, that should be the easiest thing in the world to do. That's like step one of being a Christian. (laughs) I messed up. I got some cheese falling off my cracker. I, I, I I am in a bad place. I need some outside help that I can't provide myself. Like if that's you, Uh, There's a club. It's called the church. We meet here on Sundays, okay? It's completely okay to admit that. That's your first step. And then the second step is to allow God to address the underlying issue. You have to quit numbing. You have to quit coping and escaping. And you got to get with God and you got to get with the spirit. You got to get with his word. You got to get with his people and you have to hit the underlying problem head on. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's trauma from your past and there's just a whole lot of shame and self-doubt and that's what you're numbing yourself from. Maybe it's this feeling of abandonment from a past relationship and it's this, it's this profound sense of loneliness. That's why you run to pornography. That's why you run to sex. Maybe it's fear of letting people down. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's depression whatever it is, you have to allow God to hit that problem head on. And this process is different for every single person. It's shorter for some, it's longer for others. It's definitely a community project. You're gonna need other people to help you take these steps and get through this process. I definitely recommend um, a counselor. Uh, We have small groups uh, with a theme um, uh, that specializes he- of recovery here at Hope. We're starting a men's group this coming week. And so if you're online, if you're at one of our campuses, maybe you need to join that group. Maybe God wants to use you to lead one of those groups. You can go to care at gethope.net. But you have to hit that underlying issue head on. And the first few weeks, I know, it's not fun. <laughs> The first few weeks you stop your addiction, it's not pleasant because you're letting those symptoms resurface. You're letting God do some heart work. In fact, the more unpleasant you feel, the more you know you're headed in the right direction. (laughs) That's how you know you're going and you're taking the right steps. You see, 
we want and we've trained our brain to expect quick fixes to the symptoms, but God wants to slowly heal the underlying disease. And it takes time. But as you face those unpleasant feelings head on and you allow God to work slowly, slowly you'll see, man, God is a kind and gracious and expert surgeon. And he's doing the necessary heart work that you need. And he's taking you from someone that you don't even know anymore, that you're ashamed to be, and he's turning you into the person that he's created you to be. Okay. But that's what you need to do. That's really just a long way of saying you need to confess and repent. You need to turn. And when it comes down to it, you just have to answer the question, who do you want to serve? You want to serve something that just takes and takes and never gives back? Or do you want to serve a, serve a good and loving and patient and gracious and giving, giving Savior? Who do you want to serve? And I do know that you can't do this without a relationship with your creator, without a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the second step in A, the most successful rehab program out there is reach out to a higher power. In fact, I was thinking you can't do anything that we've talked about during this whole series without a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't free yourself from depression. You can't be free of anxiety. You can't conquer your anger. You can't slow down from the busyness of life. And you certainly can't beat an addiction without a greater love, <laughs> without a savior that you're following after. So I think I would be amiss, and I think there's no better way to end this series than to give you that opportunity. Maybe you've been coming for the past three or four weeks, maybe you've been coming for the past three or four months, maybe this is your first time at a campus or watching online, but I want everyone just to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you have never begun that relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to hear that behavior modification can only take you so far but there is a living, acting Savior that wants to completely turn your life upside down. So if you've never made that decision, man, I would make it for you if I could. But if that's you, maybe just pray something like this, sitting in your living room, running on the treadmill right now at all of our campuses in this room right now. Just pray something like, God, I realize this series and especially this week that I am in need of help. I've gotten somewhere in my life that I don't like and I don't want to stay here, but I heard that I have a gracious, loving, heavenly Father, that I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do any works. I don't have to clean myself up, but I just have to admit that I have a problem and ask for your forgiveness, and you'll do that. So Father, would you forgive me of my sin? Spirit, would you come into my heart? Would you create in me a new heart? And would you transform my life for your glory and my good? Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, I would encourage you to tell someone. Just tap the person you're sitting next to right now. Tell a pastor. Tell someone online. That is the best decision that you'll ever make. So I want you to just pay attention and lean in for these last few minutes and be intentional about the questions that we're going to reflect on right now. Thanks.
And God, thank you so much for um, giving us a place where we can discuss and, and talk about these things, that uh, we can dive into these topics and these things that are tough, um, but they're honest feelings that we need to dive into. They're, they're honest things that we struggle with in our everyday life that, that God, if we don't have people, or if we don't have you around us to help us through them, we, a lot of times we may not see a way out, but I pray that we lean into the hope that Chase talked about today. I pray that, that we can all find the help that we need in other people around us, but also that we can find the help that we need in you, God. We're asking for healing for our hearts, forgiveness in those areas where um, maybe we put something else, some of our own desires ahead of you. Lord, we're asking you to step in and to get involved. We love you. We, we appreciate the fact that you care for us and love us so well. And Lord, I just pray that for anyone who has heard this message, anybody who's praying with us right now, uh, that as they move forward in their week, they don't feel like they're going through it alone, but that there is a, a community of people around them who love them, who wanna walk through this with them. And most importantly, God, that they are constantly reminded that you love them more than they could ever imagine. Uh, and it's in your name that we pray, amen. We know coming out of those reflection questions and, and dealing with the things we've been talking about over the past few weeks, that there are plenty of things that, that you have to think about now moving forward as, as we deal with these feelings and these emotions. And, and we wanna let you know and just remind you again, you don't have to walk through that stuff alone. Now, over the course of this series, while it's been great, there are a lot of resources out there that may help you on top of just these short conversations that we've been having. So we wanna encourage you, head over to gethope.net slash inside out. Over there, we have a long list of resources for all of the topics of this series that we've been talking about. If you're watching online and, and you just need somebody to talk to or someone to pray with you, there is a prayer button that's gonna pop up in the chat. Go ahead and hit that because there are volunteers and pastors here at Hope who would love to connect with you, who would love to pray for you and who care for you deeply. This is your first time being here with us and you just have some questions. Maybe you just wanna know more about what we do, uh, what type of offerings we have here around Hope or anything like that. You can go over to gethope.net slash next for some more information uh, as far as what you can do as baptism, getting involved with some classes that we have, all sorts of things like that. Guys, thank you so much for joining us this week and we encourage you to check us out next week as we launch a brand new series called House of Cards. <laughs>